and I'm really excited to uh, moderate this panel. And although it's titled Expanding Console, after getting to talk to these wonderful panelists, um, I think this is a session really about courage and experimentation as we try to increase participation at our city level. So they range from different countries, but to me they all share a really interesting common belief that console could be an important technological solution to advance participation. So each participant will share for about five to ten minutes, and then we'll have the rest of the time for questions. We are going to be using Slido for questions, so you can, ooh, let me do this. I don't know why that won't be there. You can uh, go to slido.com or you can download the app and then you enter the code console and then you ask questions and we'll upvote them. So that's where we'll do the question and answer at the end. So to start, we will hear from David from France where he is going to uh, talk about the power of console to galvanize citizen collectives for the 2020 local election. And then we'll go to Melissa Appleton from the New York City Participatory Budgeting Project, where they're experimenting with console at the city district level. It's the first experiment in New York. And then we'll talk with Petter from Digitum Labs, a Swedish NGO that actually kind of got its roots in this building. And he'll talk about console and its efforts in, uh, in Sweden. And then we'll close with uh, Vanessa looking how we can expand console through contributions and documentation and things that we can all, all do. So I'm going to give this over to David. Hello, everybody. So my name is David. Uh, I'm from France. And uh, I'm working for a nonprofit which is called Democracy Ouverte. Uh, just to, uh, quickly, uh, Democracy Ouverte is actually um, uh, a network gathering lots of uh, democratic innovation in France. And uh, our activities are to highlight our members, of course, uh, but also to, to do some lobbying uh, for, for democrat democratic innovation. Um, we, also, uh, we also have uh, activities of um, basically networking, uh, and we, we also experiment new solutions thanks to our, labor our labor laboratory. And finally, which is actually my job, we support emerging projects thanks to our, our incubator. Uh, which is called System D. Um, but this is not the point of my presentation. So, Consula has only been used once in, uh, in, uh, in France, and it was for the social housing company. Uh, so, so, I'd like to present to you uh, the digital participatory ecosystem as a whole in France uh, to understand what are the opportunities for, for, con for software such as Consula in France. Uh, so in France, we've got lots of platforms uh, regarding digital participatory democracy. Uh, I see new ones emerging every day, actually, uh, and they mostly develop in the form of companies with closed, plat with closed platforms. Um, there are very few non-profits and very few open source ones. Um, so I guess this is the, the main issue I want, to, I want to present to you and how to, how to promote open source, open source ones. Um, so actually, digital participatory democracy has become a market in France. So we have got on one side companies, and companies uh, are dealing with on the other side local authorities and or central administrations. Um, as every growing market, it's now entering a shakeout phase. So uh, so it's concentrating around big big actors, big companies. And, lo and lots of actors are disappearing. Of course, they are mostly uh, non-profits one, and they are mostly open source ones. Um, so, on the other hand, we have got big actors that are emerging, and I'd like to, to present to you what I mean when I say big actors. Uh, for instance, the leader in France is, um, it's, there, are, there are around 20 employees, I guess, uh, in, the, in, the, in, this, uh, in this company. It has raised uh, 1 million euro last year, well, more than 1 million, million euro last year. And it's, it's uh, running 10% of uh, all participatory budgeting in France. So, of course, it, it has got um, um, uh, a, a power in France. And it's, it, this kind of company can, can crush other initiatives that are more, more based on, uh, on uh, communities uh, and open source communities. So um, to understand why open source is struggling, there are lots of, lots of, uh, of, of reasons I'm not going to explain here. 
but mostly uh, we don't have uh, uh, we, we lack a global um, political vision in France, I guess, and also um, the path for development is, is made easier for companies with closed platforms. So to get out of this deadlock, um, why won't we, 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 we take digital tools out of the institutional confinement? That's my point. I, I think it could be uh, an opportunity uh, to, to actually not focus too much on institutional uh, participatory democracy, but but more on, on uh, participatory democracy in private groups and in citizen groups. So I'm, I'm going to explain uh, what I mean by this. So in, in 2020, we've got local elections in France, and it's, they are basically the, 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 bigger, the, the, the main elections after the presidential one, of course. And uh, it's, it's quite, of a, it's quite of, a big, of a big deal, and lots of citizens are already preparing this kind of elections. Um, they will have, really, we, they will have uh, lists of, uh, of, uh, of citizens uh, without any political parties in, in the municipalism movement. And I don't know if you're familiar with, the, with this movement. And uh, there are, there are, I, I see this kind of, uh, of citizens every day and they're asking me tools to organize themselves, to build programs, digital tools, I mean. So of course, they are really close to, 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 to the commons philosophy and by extension to the open source one. So um, they are looking for, for this kind of, uh, of, um, of, um, of platforms. And um, there is also one, one big opportunity, I guess. Uh, in France, we've got this collective which is gathering more than 20 NGOs uh, working on the tra transition movement. And um, they will launch a consultation in uh, 2019 in order to build a pact uh, with a lot of measures to improve local democracy. Uh, their aim is to, to have this pact signed by as much lists as possible running for, for, for local elections before they win the election. So the, to, to build this pact, they will have a, a big nation, nationwide, nationwide consultation and um, they are looking for, for tools to, 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 to do so actually. So my message is, is uh, my final message would be that those citizen groups um, might be the Troy Trojan horse uh, of, uh, of, of, of um, digital participatory democracy to get in to the institutional ground. And um, I, I will end with my presentation with a question which, which would be more on, uh, on infrastructure. Uh, basically, there are hundreds of, of groups like this. They don't have many means. They are usually not technologists. So the, the biggest challenge is to, is to find a way to have low infrastructure and to be able to, to, to give them tools digital tools to, to, to build programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, so now we will hear from Melissa, a consul in New York City. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good morning. How are you? Good? Thank you for being here so early <laughs> on the last day. We appreciate it. Um, my name is Melissa Appleton. I work at an organization in, uh, based in New York and California in the US called the Participatory Budgeting Project. Um, it's really uh, funny for me to hear uh, the questions about bringing console and an open source platform to France um, because we're one step further experimenting with console in New York City, but we actually talk a lot about Paris to try to advocate for expansion in New York. Um, we have competitive mayors. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah. oh, no, sorry. So um, what I'm going to say is just a little bit about the context of participatory budgeting with our organization, what we do in New York City um, and across the US and Canada generally, and then um, what it is that we're using console to experiment with right now, the questions we have, and some of the opportunities. Ah, thank you, that one. So, um, so we're a nonprofit. We've been around about 10 years. We focus. Uh, on participatory budgeting, trying to empower people to work together to spend public money. 
Um, and we're doing this primarily in the US and Canada. No. Yeah, no. Aye, aye. Um, so, I don't, know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. Is this the PDF? Yeah. So, um, I'll say a little bit about the work that we do and how we approach participatory budgeting. Um, I assume that folks here know what it is, right? We, we're collecting ideas from the community. We're, um, we're having community members decide of all of those ideas. Thank you. Is it a scroll? Yeah. It's a scroll. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Community members are deciding which of those ideas should move forward to a ballot for a full community vote. Um, and we have some, yeah. Uh, the PDF doesn't have the animation. So some of the things that are particular. Um, about the way we practice participatory budgeting is that we focus on community leadership, that there has to be a steering committee or some sort of community leadership group that's really shaping what it looks like. Um, for us, there has to be a binding vote. It's not just input, it's, it's deciding. Um, we talk about equity and participation <coughs> and equity in outcomes. We're not looking for it to be experiment just in having people decide on money but who's deciding and what are they deciding? So making sure that we're focusing on having underrepresented communities who don't feel um, reflected in government, being part of the process and having the money go to where it's most needed. And meaningful community participation, meaning it's not um, ideas that come from government or from the power structure. It's not the power structure deciding what's gonna go on the ballot and the community just voting. It's all throughout the process. And so that makes um, the way we do it a little bit unique from what I've learned in some places around the world. It's happening all over North America. You can see here, this map is actually really outdated already. So there's the plus sign. Um, and I should have said, I'm sorry that the slides are not bilingual, but hopefully I'll capture what's said on them so you can understand if you're uh, not an English speaker. I'm gonna focus on New York. So um, participatory budgeting in New York is now in its eighth year. It started with four council members who decided to do this together, but with their own budget. They have a discretionary budget. They decide to opt in. They don't have to do it. And we're now expanded to 32 council districts across the city. But it's not all council districts. Um, so there's lots of opportunity for expansion that I'll talk about. But, um, most of participatory budgeting in New York is with capital budgets. They're very um, inflexible. It's a lot of money for city infrastructure improvements, um, but things are very expensive, projects are very slow, um, and when you ask someone what they want, their first answer isn't always a new crosswalk or you know, a new playground. They might want those things, but usually they say, job training or new housing, right? There's other things that people want. Um, and so while we really, really love the work that we do, and in particular, um, we've done a lot to engage young people. Uh, our voting age in New York is down to 11, so age 11 and up. Um, but across North America, we see the same things that make PB challenging. We see it in New York. Um, so one is it's knowledge intensive, right? Uh, to run a really effective process the way that we do it. The staff who do this need to really understand how it works. They need to know um, how to do outreach, how to put together a ballot, how to uh, go through all the phases and how to do volunteer management. They need to know all of it. Um, and so when there's staff turnover, right, it goes wrong. Um, it's resource intensive, meaning that it takes a lot of attention, a lot of people, um, a lot of uh, funding, really, to make it go well and to engage those communities that we're uh, really trying to engage. And uh, another challenge we see in North America um, and in New York is that there weren't mechanisms for really sharing information, even though one of our values was transparency. 
Um, there wasn't information to share what happened between when the ideas were collected and when there was a vote, and there wasn't information about what happened after the vote either. Um, so the organization has been um, looking at ways to address these pain points, and one of the things we're exploring is an online platform, right? Thinking that some of those problems can be addressed, not all of them, not entirely, but some of them can be um, alleviated with an online platform that leads people through the process and that helps sort the information and that tracks all the information and shares it publicly. And so this year, um, we're experimenting. We have two council members in New York who uh, do participatory budgeting, not just with their expense budgets, sorry, not just with their capital budgets, but also with expense, which is more flexible. Um, if folks are interested, I have a sample ballot from one of the budgets uh, last year from expense. It's projects and services, and they're really fascinating projects that meet community needs. And these two council members are doing it together for the first time, and they're using the console platform with our help, um, and definitely with the help of folks here um, in Madrid. We're not sure what it's going to look like, right? This is our first experiment. We've had to, some of you might have seen my colleague Francesco speak yesterday, we've had to adopt um, some things and modify some things uh, to really match the way that we practice participatory budgeting. Um, but we're hopeful that it'll be a useful tool. And one of the reasons is because we've just had this huge victory in New York. Um, I also have the full flyer if someone wants to see it. So in our election this month, um, there were three ballot proposals. After listening to the um, presentations on citizen panels, I wish that ours had been coming from citizen panels, but we ended up with ballot proposals that were good. Um, and all the people in New York voted, and they voted yes on all of them. And one of them was to create a civic engagement um, commission, like an office of civic engagement for the first time in the city. And it's tasked with doing citywide participatory budgeting. So in addition to what's happening at the council, um, this is a huge, huge opportunity for us. We've been advocating for it for many years. Um, but because it's going to be housed in this group that does broader participation and makes it easier for New Yorkers to get involved in government and get involved in their communities and in planning and in you know, city agencies, we're looking now to see what can an online platform do to support participatory budgeting and other forms of participation. So um, we have questions and we have an experiment. Uh, and I'm really, really honored to be here and learning from everyone who's been trying this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. So up next, we'll have Peter. And just a reminder, for questions, if you go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com and enter console, you can uh, start entering questions or upvoting questions, and we'll do that after two more presentations. Is this going to be enough? Uh, yeah. Can I just switch to this? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Peter Joelsson from uh, GGN Lab, based in Sweden. And i um, really happy to be here with these amazing people and this great conference, so thank you so much. Um, I'm going to say a few short things about wh what we do in Digital Lab and uh, also some of our work and views on, on how, to, um, how to use console to engage underrepresented groups in participatory processes, which we've been looking at this last year. Uh, can you hear me good enough? Yeah. So uh, we're a non-profit lab for participatory democracy based in Sweden, and um, our, our main perspective has been to, to build participation from below. Um, so, so one of the things we do is like we, we're mentoring and sponsoring young people in projects about participatory democracy and digital tools. Some of them are about, some of these projects are about Consul, um, like the, the person doing the German translation of Consul right now is one of our project leaders. And um, other projects are like Victoria is here. It's going to do a women-only hackathon in, in, around civic tech in Stockholm in January. Um, so in total, we have, we've had 
25 people working on projects this year. Um, so that's a big part of what we do. And um, we're also trying to strengthen the civic tech community in Sweden in general by, um, by doing hackathons and meetups um, around these issues. Um, and uh, like on an international level, I, I got involved in these uh, collective intelligence um, hackathons here at the Media Lab two years ago. And that was, uh, that was a big inspiration for us when we, when we started out. And um, so last year, I did this project together with Vanessa uh, around console and working on how to, how to low, make it easier for people to install and use console in different ways by community documentation, installation scripts. You might talk more about this. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So... Um, um, this, this got us into console and thinking about how to implement this in a Swedish context. Like, um, um, and the, our perspective on this was to, to see how we could use console to increase participation for uh, groups that are, are underrepresented in, in Swedish politics and in, uh, in local policy making. So, uh, particularly women, immigrants, and young people. Um, as you might know, that, like, the overall political context in Sweden is that we have our third biggest party um, is a fascist party with its roots in, in the neo-Nazi movement. Um, we, I, I mean, we used to be this welfare country that has like, been sliding slowly over the last 30 years. Um, so there are a lot of social issues and issues about representation and, um, and um, how to push for democracy. That, like, the discussion about democracies is very much hijacked by the, like, the right wing and the right wing populists at the moment. Um, so we're thinking like, if, if we're going to use digital platforms, it has to increase participation. From, it has to be representative, otherwise what, what's the point? Um, so, so what we've done this last year is like um, documenting methods and tools for participatory processes um, and documenting this for people who work in city administrations. Um, we've been working together with four city districts in, in Gothenburg and Stockholm <laughs> who, who are doing or have done um, participatory budgeting. And uh, we made a Swedish translation and, and demo version of Consul. Um, we did user testing with underrepresented groups. And, uh, and then we got the chance to go to, to Paris and uh, meet David and others and to look at their participatory budget. And so now we're sort of in a phase of documenting these experiences and bringing it together. Um, but uh, the this documentation site that we made, it's unfortunately it's all in Swedish now, but we're happy to talk about translation and forking it. But it's, it's a site <coughs> where we write short guides about tools, methods, and resources, um, specifically for people in city, um, civil servants, politicians. Um, and this is our Swedish console demo. Um, and here's some, some photos from our user testing. We did user testing in two, uh, um, two sessions with, with 25 people. Um, just to, and, and it got us a lot of insights and, and feedback about both console and, uh, and about how to talk about participatory process, so it's what kind of language to use, how to present it, and so on. Um, so it's been really useful. Oh, got stuck. And, uh, and this is from Paris, um, where we, we talked to and interviewed a lot of people in, in different levels of these processes, like um, some of the project, some of the successful projects, some of the people working with this, some of the organizations involved, like David's. Um, 
And uh, yeah, it also gave us a lot of insights about met methods that has been working, that has not been working, like best practices. Um, so it's very fascinating. And like our our main um, our, our main like lessons or or uh, points that we bring with us from this is one. The first thing is like context is really important. The the context here in in Spain and Madrid is kind of unique with with a movement building up to all of this. And uh, we found in our user testing, for example, that uh, our um, the, for some of the group, some of the people, we just showed them the platform and they started using it. For others, we, we gave them an introduction to how it came about, how console came about, and the movement. Um, there was a reaction to, to unemployment and corruption. And those people were, that got the context were very much more willing to understand console and not just to see it as, as another like, digitalization project from above. So that was interesting, and but like overall, we think that all of, all of this is about like building trust um, with people, and and this can this can be done in, in a lot of different ways, um, like by having binding processes, by having independent organizations working with facilitate, facilitating the processes, um, by bringing in civil society at an early stage. Um, and by like here in Media Lab having an active community around the platform itself. Um, <coughs> so, so that's some of the quick lessons. And, and what we want to do now is like implementing console for next year and really trying to design um, citizen-centered participatory processes um, where we can use console as a way of scaling up and maybe also as a way of setting a standard for how to do the process. Um, and we really believe that like now that the way forward is continue to build like a diverse community around the platform to bring in these experiences from lots of different countries and lots of different contexts um, to, go, to go forward. So thank you. Thank you, Peter. And last, we'll have Vanessa. Hello, everybody. Uh, I will speak in Spanish because we are in Spain, so we can you can like speak for your radios who didn't did it yet. Uh, bueno, voy a hablar español porque estamos en España, o un poco Spanglish y un poco bueno, uh, voy a hablar un poco de las acciones que yo hice en este año para empezar la, la construcción de una con, comunidad de consul en, en Brasil y quiero compartir esta experiencia para que se inspire para hacer en, en el país de ustedes. Uh, bueno, yo soy Vanessa, yo soy profesora y desarrolladora y soy estudiante de, maest de la maestría en ciencia de computación en la Universidad de San Paulo y también soy coordinadora de un hackerspace feminista en San Paulo eh, llamado María Lab y también soy voluntaria de CONSU. <risa> eh, bueno, la primera cosa, eh, o oh, una de las primeras cosas que empecé a hacer para CONSU es que ¿esto me eh, bueno, eh, fue que año pasado junto con Gideon Lab, Peter y eh, todo este equipo muy lindo um, participamos del laboratorio de inteligencia colectiva para la democracia aquí en Media Lab y e hicimos el proyecto Consul Going Worldwide para hacer acciones para eh, expandir Consul eh, hicimos básicamente nuestros resultados fueron vale así así está mejor vale <risa> disculpa 
Eh, hicimos eh, tres cosas eh, en este proyecto de Participa Lab, fue el manual, eh, la web de manual. Después hicimos un foro, eh, la web community, community eh, que para haber un foro abierto, abierto de preguntas sobre coto, no solo con preguntas eh, técnicas, pero más preguntas de política, de implementación eh, política, de leyes, de experiencias entre otras ciudades o organizaciones que utilizan coto. Y para los de developers, los desarrolladores, hicimos un, un primero un script inicial de, de Docker para que eh, se quede un poco más fácil eh, instalar Consul. Bueno, algunas ideas para construir una comunidad eh, de Consul en su país. En la universidad y en conferencias de tecnología fue lo que hice y quiero compartir lo que hice. Eh, este año le empecé la maestría en ciencia de la computación en la Universidad, Universidad de San Paulo y la primera clase que yo me inscribí fue de desarrollo de software libre. Y el profesor nos pidió como un, una tarea de la, de la clase eh, contribuir para un software libre y yo elegí Consul. <risa> y hice un poco de, de algunas contribuciones en la documentación, eh, seguí eh, eh, como contestando preguntas del foro, ayudando a la PC en el Slack y en el foro de la comunidad, pero junto conmigo una colega de clase, eh, Fatma, eh, ella es una colega eh, intercambista, exchange student, eh, y ella um, es de Irán, y ella añadió la traducción de Consul para Persa, uh, sí, eh, ella casi terminó, pero también ella con una amiga de Irán eh, estaban revisando uh, la traducción para Persa, porque Irán es una ciudad de que es un país que necesita mucho la participación y de sus problemas. Eh, ella está hablando de poner electricidad en las ciudades que ella nació, eh, pero su amiga de Irán fue, fue arrested, <ríe> fue presa por ser activista. Moving. Quiero saber. Vale. Yo estoy viendo. Ah, ahora sí. Ahora habemos un micrófono. Gracias. Eh, vamos. A... Ahora está súper. Vale. Entonces, si eres un profesor o si estudia en una universidad, puede hacer como promover disciplinas de desarrollo de software libre e elegir como consul un software para contribuir y hacer cosas muy, muy buenas. Eh, y con esto, eh, yo también eh, agregué consul en Open, Open Hub, que es una plataforma de exhibición de proyectos open source, como un catálogo para la gente que quiera contribuir, y puede como ver las estadísticas estadísticas para la gente decidir si es un buen proyecto para contribuir o no. En las conferencias de tecnología, yo fui al FISLI, que es el Foro Internacional de Software Libre, que es la más grande conferencia de software libre de Brasil, existe a como 18 años y llega a tener como 5 mil personas y yo hice una charla y porque esta conferencia se pasa en Porto Alegre, una de las ciudades que hay con su instalado. Entonces, yo creí que hay mucha gente interesada en contribuir y hacer cosas con Consul por ser un software que está siendo utilizado en nuestro país. Bueno, los resultados de estas acciones fueron que, bueno, yo... Conocí a la gente, los desarrolladores de Consul de Porto Alegre. Después de hacer esta charla en Porto Alegre, fuimos hasta uh, la empresa pública que hizo, hizo lo desarrollo. Y también 
uh, y se, uh, conocí toda la gente de, uh, de la parte de la ciudad de Porto Alegre para ayudarlos con dudas y todo más. Fue muy, muy uh, provechoso. Y la segunda razón es que uh, después de hacer esta charla, tuvimos más más otro gobierno interesado en instalar con so que fue el estado de Pernambuco en el nordeste del país. So, entonces, a ellos me enviaron un email porque habían escuchado que había hablado sobre consul en, la, en el FISLI. So, enviaron un, un correo eh, sacando un montón de dudas. Hicimos una conferencia con la gente de tecnología del estado y en, si, si encantaron de Consul, eh, yo presenté todas las funcionalidades de todo y presenté también las plataformas, la equipo, los, los core developers y ahora están con eh, Consul para el estado de Pernambuco casi listo. Mira qué bello. <ríe> bueno, eh, entonces el estado quiere hacer más consultas a la población de cómo van a... En cuestiones del Estado e integración entre lo, lo, las otras esferas de poder, como los municipios y hasta el federal. Uh, y también eh, la gente del de, de campo de USP eh, en la ciudad de San Carlos, eh, la, la área de, de los pesquisadores de urbanismo y arquitectura están implementando CONSUM y estoy ayudando a ellos y ellas. Um, a hacer una, una, como una, una parte de implementación de consul para consulta de patrimonio de la ciudad. Entonces, un uso diferenciado del consul. Eh, dos personas de este equipo de pesquisadores estaban en, también en, en Participa Lab, la primera edición de 2016, que fue Sandra y Juliana. Eh, ¿Y cuándo que vamos a empezar a contribuir para consul? Ahora. Ahora, ahora mismo tú puedes hacer cosas para Consul. Hay el foro de la comunidad, puede ahora entrar y hacer su cuenta y empezar a hacer cuestión, a ayudar a contestar las preguntas. Eh, y la página de manual, eh, yo, Peter y muchos de otros que están aquí, somos como administradores del contenido, puedes contactarnos para... Uh, poner más contenido en esta web de manual y también si quieres podemos hacer como un login de autor de, de contenido eh, y quien desarrolla puede ver todos los repositorios de código de consul como el propio código del consul, la documentación técnica que necesita también siempre actualización IO instalador automático. Bueno, ¿y tú? ¿Qué puedes hacer ahora para contribuir para Consul? Piensas un poquito, ¿qué puedo hacer ahora? He dejado esta pregunta a ustedes. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Vanessa. Thanks to all. Let's pull up these questions. All right, let's get started with some of these. And if you don't want to input your questions digitally, well, we can also take questions from the audience. Um, so this is, I guess, for all of you, but what attracted you to console in the first place? Like you're all at these experimental stages, why, why console? So, um I don't have a technical background, but the colleagues I have that do have done a lot of research and looked at a lot of platforms. Um, I know that they appreciated the console community and the fact that um, the city of Madrid has been so supportive and um, encouraging and helpful, um, and, and that there's this whole open source community behind it. So those are some of the reasons we're looking at the platform. 
for me was uh, because you know we as a developer we are always uh, looking for meaning in our, in our job <laughs> and um, I think I was feeling that I needed to contribute with the society with the knowledge I have so uh, for me console was a way to try to help the society to be more fair for everyone for everybody so yeah I think console could give it, it this thing for me and also the thing I do for the console do for me I can retribute back for people who use and the community around and all of things around um, yeah I would say like for, for me or for us, it was two things. I mean, one thing is that this is actually being used. It's, it's not like this utopian idea about a platform that might work in the future, but it's being used right now, and it works really well. So that's the one thing. And the other thing has been like, that the console community is, is really friendly and really welcoming and has been supportive. Um, so those two, those are the main things. Um, regarding the, the French uh, ecosystem, I guess it's, uh, which is basically a, a market now, I guess it's super, super important to, to, to promote um, other type of solutions which are open source ones. And uh, while well, I do my best, uh, my best at my personal level to advocate for this kind of, of platforms in France, yet still a lot of work to do, I guess. But I see some opportunities to, to, to go further in this, uh, in this uh, common Commons philosophy in France. Pardon? Danny, ah, we can do one back there. Um, thank you. I guess a kind of a more kind of cultural or public innovation question. So, one of the challenges we often face when kind of trying to spread innovations between governments is that they have this kind of not invented here syndrome. So, you know, console is a great platform, but it wasn't made in Sweden or made in France. And often local authorities will resist it because it needs to be something made by them for their place. H have you ever felt this? Or is it like natural for them to adapt this platform to New York, for example? Or do you get a bit of like, no, we need to make our own? Does that make sense as a question? I think so. So you're asking what adaptations might have been necessary to make it work in our different contexts? Yeah, and guess how do you overcome the kind of within public administrations often this, this drive to, to create something that is made here, you know, our own thing rather than something that comes in from the outside that was yeah. someone else's that we adapted? Uh, so f just for New York specifically, um, the city is, has already been working with uh, a proprietary company not based in North America at all. Um, and so to have an open source platform, I think they're, they're willing to work with other people. Um, and also our organization is working very hard to adapt it for the North American context, specifically for New York. So it wasn't um, just ready to put it down in New York and start using it. I don't know if I have a lot of, I mean, I think the, the functionality of the platform is pretty straightforward. It's not like the yeah, other proposals, that's what you think. Um, so, so to us, that, that's, not, that's not a huge thing to, to adapt that. Our main thing has been about like finding, finding a language, finding a terminology to explain like what's the difference between a citizen proposal and a, budget investment proposal, for example, for people who have like, no idea about this before. That, that's, uh, that takes quite a lot of explaining. So it sounds like your project, you've done, Melissa's project, you've done more like adaptations to the actual platform itself. And for you, Peter, it's really been around the language and how, how to make it, uh, I guess, welcoming for, for your user group. Um, can you can you talk a little bit more about like what challenges or what things you learned in your user testing with console? And also, I don't know if anyone else did you do user testing or piloting? Are you getting any results in? <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, I don't, my, my colleagues here, Sana and Pierre, might have more to add to this because they did actually interviews at the user testing, but, but, um, but a lot of the results were about like these things that I just said, like explaining the actual process, explaining how it works, what are the difference between these different, these different kind of processes, how does a participatory budget process work, and also about like what I said about context, about how you perceive the platform, if you perceive it as something that's um, another thing can, coming from above, like all of these like digitalization processes where you have to do all the work yourself, book all your tickets, like find your hotel yourself, like um, I don't know, just another, if, if you see it as as another thing that you have, complicated thing that you have to do on the internet, or if you see it as something that's actually for you. What? Um, like, the testing that we did when, when they didn't get any introduction to it, when we were just like, oh, here's this web page, what do you think, what do you think it's for? Um, they were a bit reluctant, I would say. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> so, and and the other group where we where we did some introduction to like this um, how it came about, um, the political background to why it was created in Spain, they had a much more positive view of like and were much more willing to understand the functionality and how to use it. So that made a huge difference. Hola, sí, Gustavo Candia de Asunción, Paraguay. Nosotros en el gobierno municipal de la ciudad de Asunción tenemos, eh, perdón, ¿están, están, están entendiendo? Eh, tenemos eh, algunas experiencias de, de consultas, eh, perdón el español, pero no tengo inglés. Estamos haciendo experiencias de consultas en Asunción del Paraguay. Sin embargo, tanto las ONGs como los ciudadanos nos reclaman, bueno, ¿qué garantías tenemos de que esas consultas están como controladas por la propia ciudadanía? ¿no? Entonces, me interesa muchísimo saber en cuánto tiempo entre la decisión política de incorporar tecnología como la de cónsul o cualquiera de sus variantes o cualquiera de sus adaptaciones, nos llevaría en Asunción, ¿cuál sería más o menos un, un tiempo de proceso para que todos nuestros procesos participativos tengan esa herramienta, ¿verdad? incorporen esa herramienta y podamos incluso incorporar estos reclamos de organizaciones de sociedad civil temáticas, en algunos casos, ambientales, ambientalistas, este, LGBTI, ¿verdad? ¿cómo podemos hacer para conjugar esas esa expectativas en este instrumento? No, no tenemos experiencias en Asunción, pero nos interesa muchísimo. Estuve siguiendo todas las conferencias, así que... Parece que ustedes nos pueden dar una idea de cuál es el tiempo que nos llevaría ir haciendo este proceso en, en algo en que comienza recién, en, una, en un municipio que comienza recién. So, para aclarar, su, su pregunta es cuánto ¿Cuál? tiempo llevaría para hacer un proceso, imple, implementación de CONSOL? Exacto. ¿Cuán? Ok. So, his question is around how much time it will take to implement it. And I think everyone will have maybe a different context. Yo no sé decir el tiempo porque esto es muy, eh, de, depende mucho de cuando, cuan, creo que la, lo proceso debe empezar eh, antes de, de la tecnología digital, debe estar más eh, firme eh, en presencial, con el papelito, con las reuniones y así cuando se tiren como echan de menos un proceso más digital para más gente ver su, su, que está un tra lo trabajo que están haciendo, que es el caso de Porto Alegre. Porto Alegre en, en Brasil eh, hay eh, el orzamiento... Eh, sí, eh, hace 30 años y ya está súper eh, muy bien formado y ahora necesitan eh, expandir y van a utilizar console para esto. Y esto es eh, eh, un poco 
próximo con la primera pregunta, porque como ellos ya tenían una metodología toda pronta, lista para el eh, orzamento participativo, eh, eh, fue necesario hacer muchas, eh, eh, muchos cambios en la plataforma digital para, se, para hacerlo, hacerla más, pare, eh, más próxima de, de que ya hay la metodología que ellos tienen presencialmente. Eh, entonces, eh, yo sé que Porto Alegre está como trabajando un poco para documentar su metodología de participación para que otras ciudades puedan utilizar, pero yo creo que esta es la receta del suceso, <ríe> como hacer primero la gente y después eh, hacer la plataforma digital, pero eh, entiendo que necesitamos hacer como una divulgación, mostrar que existe esta plataforma digital eh, y que está lista para ser utilizada para toda la gente, porque eh, luego puede surgir no, nuevos movimientos sociales, nuevas reuniones de otros asuntos que van a necesitar una plataforma y cuando eh, sentiren la necesidad ya saben que la plataforma existe. Entonces, también necesita ya hacer como la divulgación de esta plataforma antes de algunos movimientos surgiren o cosas así. Entonces, hay un poco de cada lado. Yeah, I could just give some specifics for the, the North American context and for New York. Um, we've been researching online platforms for over a year. Um, I think, I don't know if Devin's in this room, but um, we've been working with developers for maybe six months now. Um, some of the things that we need to think about in New York, New York uses eight languages, five official languages, and participatory budgeting uses more. Um, the pilot right now is, I think, going to be in Spanish and English, but in order to make this work for the city, it's going to have to be fully functional in those languages. Um, it's going to have to work with the way we do proposal development, which is an in-person deliberative process off the platform where people then are going to submit their ideas, but it's not the same sort of kind of up and down voting that leads things to uh, be on a ballot in other places. Um, then we're going to do user testing, and then we're doing this in schools. We do a lot of work in schools in New York and in other places, and the process is different, so we'll have to go through it all again for schools. The fact is that in France we are really, really, it's, we, we first need to, to explain why it's really dangerous to use closed platforms. So I cannot really answer the, the time, the time schedule and stuff, because we are, we, we need to progress more in, uh, in this, uh, in this kind of, uh, of thinking about uh, what is it, what is at stake when we use a closed platform? What is, is it, is it privatization of democracy? Uh, so we first need to answer this kind of question from a political viewpoint, I mean, I mean to have to move on and uh, expanding more. All right, so we have one more question. And it's a question that I'm, I'm curious, since you're all kind of in experimental stages, what would your question be to other people that are further along in their console projects? And maybe this will be a nice way to end so you can chat with folks in the audience afterwards. So for me, um, I'm really interested in, with folks who have implemented console um, for participatory budgeting or not, what assumptions are you making about who's going to be there to support it and what kind, of, um, what kind of capacity needs to be in place to make it work successfully? Um, we need to think about staffing a lot and resources in New York and in other places. Well. In my presentation, I already had already given some questions about it and uh, what you can do for help console right now. Who, who, who is seeing, implementing, testing? What you feel that is missing and what you can do for feel that miss? <laughs> um, yeah, I think what I'm interested in like is 
how how do you use um, how do you use console together with like face to face and physical methods and uh, how do you how do you ensure um, the participation of civil society and the involvement of of um, um, of different groups to make it representative um, on this question I would love to see how how console could work on um, uh, out of the institutional um, uh, out of the institutional ground um, so I mean out of uh, out of a city uh, uh, and more to organize uh, citizen groups and uh, that would be really interesting to see how to use it to, to do participatory democracy but without institutions all right thank you all so very much for preparing and coming and chatting this has been great and thank you to the audience uh, ah do I have time? Do we have time for one more question? Let's do it. Um, hello, I'm Paul Valencia from Ecuador. Uh, we, I have an enterprise that implement Consul in, in Quito. And also we developed two, two new models for, for the Consul platform. As, and as you know, Consul is a web platform that works really fine. But we detect that maybe it's necessary to have an APP, an application mobile, uh, for consul, in order to the citizens can follow the, the votations, can follow the process, can follow the debates in real time, as with push notifications and something like that. Do you think that's really necessary? Do you detect in your cities something like that? Uh, I don't think a native app uh, is necessary, but I think uh, some good mobile user interf interfaces is really needed um, because uh, native uh, apps are really hard to maintain, to develop and maintain. You, you know it, <laughs> but I think most, lot of people ask for that. Uh, there is new standards for web uh, that we can use and try to implement on console, call it progressive web apps, and we can swift or add this uh, functionality on console because soon the, the app stores will do a search on the web looking for page who has, web page who has uh, implemented this standard of a PWA, progressive web app. Yeah, and the pages that already have implemented this they will be offered in the, store and, and the app stores as an app, but in the background, this is still a web page. So it is the really more maintainable thing that we can do for console now, instead of try to develop like a mobile, uh, mobile uh, clients uh, for Android or iPhone or whatever it will arrive now. So, uh, the thing that is that we, if you believe in openness and open standards and software, uh, free software libre, uh, we need to also do, make use of these open technologies that are developed by W3C uh, for the open web. So I think we, we should have a nice uh, like synergy with this this philosophy or thing that uh, W3C do to, so I don't I don't know what you think about. I know you are the, a software company uh, owner, <laughs> and um, but I think it's more maintainable a way to to solve this thing of the the need of app. Now it's not app we need. We need a good uh, mobile uh, experience. And I think the thing that really need, really need to improve and involve in console has a nice uh, user experience uh, uh, experience. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Fantastic. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful way to end to this call to really putting our values uh, where uh, where they should be. So thank you so much. A big round of applause, please, for these amazing panelists.